Welcome back to Block TV and now time for Long Read Sundays. Now, every Sunday the crypto community receives a treat in the form of a well-researched and thought out Twitter thread by one of the top writers documenting the ecosystem. I'm talking of course about Nathaniel Whitmore and his Long Read Sunday Twitter column. Nathaniel is joining us again this week to take us through some of the top highlights that he's curated from his column. Nathaniel, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, how you doing? Very good. But before we get into your top five for this week, of course, a uh, bit of breaking news, as it were, that's uh, rocking the sphere. That is, of course, the announcement by Binance of their Venus project, an ambitious uh, open platform project uh, bringing fiat currencies into the digital ecosystem from around the world. Some are calling this a challenger to Libra, others saying it, go, it goes even beyond that. Nathaniel, wh what are your thoughts? Yeah, this is one of those weeks where by the time we're here on Monday, Long Read Sunday is already so far in the rear view because of uh, because of new news. So I think headlined, obviously, by by this one. So um, it's really interesting. So we don't have that much information. The announcement was made in uh, released in Chinese only first and then started to kind of leak into the uh, English speaking press. And what it looks like is a regionalized uh, stablecoin project. So basically, um, you know, a, a version of Libra, but maybe pegged to local currencies, uh, and, and but but on a on a stablecoin version. And so the thing that's interesting about this is that it's a bet in some ways that um, that the idea of a digital cryptocurrency as a replacement for uh, for for kind of fiat money is inevitable. Right, that the convenience is too much, the ease of use is too much, uh, and that it's going to happen. But what what Binance seems to be betting on with Venus is the idea that um, rather than kind of a transnational global currency like Libra, uh, maybe people are going to be more interested in in regional uh, currencies that are pegged to either either their their local kind of national fiat currency or or more maybe a regional basket. So um, I think that it's it's classic Binance too in the sense that it's also a, I think a bit of a probably a regulatory arbitrage play where it's likely that they go after uh, areas and regions first where it's going to be harder for, for Libra because of kind of existing uh, political will. Um, but perhaps they're, they're interested in the technology and the idea uh, and would like a partner like Binance. So, I mean, on first glance, it's another brilliant move and, and frankly is going to create a huge competitive force in this market. And, and if anything, accelerate the uh, the kind of fiat pegged global uh, global stable corn wars to a, to a whole nother level. Uh, certainly, I mean, it seems an interesting approach in the sense that I would say Libra looks like a top down project, you know, working with the, the major global currencies, building a, a, a you know, a, dis, a, a cryptocurrency layer over the top of that and then distributing it out to the world. This seems on the opposite sense, almost a, a bottom up in a sense, taking the, the smaller fiat currencies from around the world and creating specific partnerships with countries. But certainly, I mean, I, I worry that for Binance's sake that this project requires buy in from so many different stakeholders at the individual you know, fiat currency level and government level. Do you think they're going to be able to actually achieve that? Do you think they have the wherewithal and the, the name recognition to actually get that project underway? I think there's an argument that having a little less name recognition is actually a, a pretty valuable asset in this space. So if you're a if you're a regulator, if you're a politician somewhere around the world, and uh, you're trying to figure out who this company approaching you with this idea for a stablecoin is, and they say it's like Libra, but it's just for you. It's just for your country or just for your region. And they're like, well, first of all, I have to figure out who the heck you are because they don't have that uh, negative impression that they have with Facebook. They don't have the kind of this idea of um, basically a global digital colonizer which is what all of these you know, huge platforms are ultimately in some ways. But then they look into crypto and they find out that Binance is about as big a brand as you can get in crypto. Um, and then it has such a strong reputation. Um, I, so I think in some ways, the, the, where they sit in a reputational space might be interesting. I think the other thing is, um, it strikes me that Binance is extraordinarily opportunistic and they're, they're almost presenting this as kind of a platform model where uh, I wouldn't be surprised if where they build first is where they can find those best relationships, um, which has been their model historically, right? You know, they didn't choose Uganda as their first fiat to crypto market because of the essential importance of Uganda to the global or even East African, you know, uh, markets. They chose it because there was the, the right combination of, uh, of will um, and support locally, right? So I would expect to see something similar in this case. 
Well, certainly it'll be an interesting one to watch to see how this project plays out. As we said, at the moment we only have scant detail, but uh, with plenty more to come, I'm sure it'll be a project we can watch closely and could be a big ch game changer in this sphere. All right, so kicking us off this week for Long Read Sunday, we've got number five with Travis Kling's statements earlier this week talking about the narrative of uh, Bitcoin as this safe haven currency and how that uh, narrative didn't necessarily play out this week. Uh, what can you tell us? Yeah, so over the last three weeks or so, you've seen this narrative convergence, you could say, where you have the global macro community who are looking um, and kind of uh, echoing a lot of the themes that we've been talking about in the Bitcoin community for the past few months, which is this idea of Bitcoin as a potentially generational hedge uh, against what's likely to go wrong in a, in a future recession. Um, and then this was really accentuated uh, a couple weeks ago when um, stock markets really tanked on the news of uh, you know acceleration in the China in the trade war with China um, between the U.S. and China, and Bitcoin performed really well. And so that that's when you started to see the mainstream media jump in and say, is this is this the new safe haven narrative? Um, and so that was kind of everywhere a couple weeks ago. Now this. That this past week, uh, you know, when when stocks went down, so did Bitcoin. Everything was kind of going down, and so all of a sudden, people were like, "Oh, well, I guess it was just, you know, what about the narrative? What about the narrative?" And and it, the, I think the the interesting thing, um, and what Travis is getting at is two things. One is um, it's clear that to w whatever extent there is. Uh, a potential for Bitcoin to be a safe haven. It's not acting like that all, all the time, right? It's not just, it's not anti-correlated or kind of negatively correlated with um, with stocks and other, other parts of the economy yet. Uh, and he goes on to kind of speculate about what it might be um, and whether, you know, as this post kind of jokingly alludes to, we just have no idea what's going on with the Bitcoin price at any given time. However, there is something underlying, which is important, which he kind of mentions in his second tweet, which is this idea that the, the real interesting part about this narrative isn't so much whether over the next three weeks or three months even, uh, Bitcoin always acts opposite to whatever the market does uh, in, a, in a positive way for Bitcoin, but whether uh, from a long-term kind of generational perspective, you're seeing a shift of people looking at Bitcoin as a digital gold, as, a, uh, as an alternative to equities. And so I think that that idea is still very much alive. And I think that the, the global macro community isn't going to look at, you know, a, a single week of, of performance as, a, as the indicator. It's certainly uh, more than a week of performance is needed. Do you think that's the, the issue here, that it's a, a matter of uh, just historical fidelity, that we're yet to see this sort of play out into longer term where these narratives can really be built out? Or do we have enough information to work with and it's just simply that there isn't the correlation? No, I, I think that it's it's uh, about the long term. I mean, at, at any, you can certainly draw conclusions that at any given moment or at any moment in time, it's not acting in, in this or that uh, type of way. However, I think that when we're talking about um, these real much longer term generational narratives, it's just a time question. And, uh, and I don't think we have any idea. Also, I think that this is, you know, narratives are ultimately acts of self-fulfilling prophecy. And part of the reason um, that so many people are excited about this idea of Bitcoin as a safe haven asset is that every time someone suggests that and there's any evidence uh, of it, it, it makes it more more likely to be true. Hmm. I guess that phrase we're, I'm all, we're always told to avoid in journalism, but one I have to use now, time will tell. I guess we'll have to wait <laughs> and see. All right, but now on to your number four for this week. And this is one, you know, from the old ICO boom that uh, so many had wished would die, but is still kicking on the Veritaseum uh, ICO of, uh, you know, uh, not so long ago now still causing headaches. Uh, why does this come back into the public sphere? Well, I think that the, the, the big thing is, you know, Crypto moves so fast from a, a community standpoint and a narrative standpoint. You know, we move through ICOs and into IEOs, and you know, there's STOs who are floating off on the horizon. And we're talking about stable coins and DeFi, and you know, central bank digital currencies. And so we we rip through acronyms in this space, right? Um, but the rest of the world doesn't necessarily function like that. Uh, and in particular, when it comes to regulatory enforcement, uh, we had a reminder last week that while we may be done with a lot of these ICOs, the SEC certainly isn't. So the SEC filed kind of an emergency lawsuit against uh, Vericium to try to freeze the assets of the, the chief kind of promoter behind the project um, and asking them to uh, asking for him to be kind of banned from all future securities offerings. And, um, and so I think that the, the reminder is that uh, the, IC, the, the SEC rather is not done 
with its ICO enforcement actions. And um, as that continues, it's going to likely have impacts on how people think about tokenization and what they are and aren't willing to experiment with and where they are and aren't going to be domiciled. Uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is a, is a reality. So notable, there are, there are a few different uh, SEC actions last week, and this was kind of the most prominent in terms of where the, where the project fits in the public eye. Well, it certainly is an interesting one as well because uh, the SEC specifically was requesting that uh, Veritasium stop utilizing the money, stop spending the money that they'd got from their uh, fraudulent IPO, the $8 million or so that they'd gathered from their fraudulent IPO. So, I mean, this is a case of as much as the crypto sphere may have moved on, the money at stake is still very much real and still very much in play, something I think uh, as crypto and mainstream uh, financial worlds get tied ever more, is a reality we're going to have to deal with here, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it may be, in fact, that where it was prioritized had to do with what they thought they could uh, you know, freeze or seize, right? Um, so I, I think that that's a, a hugely important detail. Uh, and again, it's, I mean, it's going to be interesting to watch. We still don't have clear guidance on um, exactly how everything plays out. However, I think that this one uh, wasn't a particular surprise to see some sort of SEC enforcement around it for, for those people who were watching when it happened. Yeah, all the uh, very interesting to see how, how the SEC handles this in the future and how the crypto sphere handles this in terms of a reputational and developmental project. Is this something that holds people back, keeps people out, or we can all move forward from? But now let's move over to your number three for this week, which uh, was an interesting question posed by Jill Carlson. The idea of what happens if someday one entity custodies all 21 million bitcoins? Very interesting question to raise and a thought experiment well worth having. Yeah, so uh, the, the uh, kind of what preceded this was a, um, a question or, or rather uh, an announcement that Coinbase was acquiring uh, Zappos institutional custody business. So they weren't require, acquiring the entire company, they were just acquiring this line of business. And I think that uh, something like 4.6% of Bitcoins will now be custodied by this combined entity. Uh, I think that's what it is. It could be wrong about that, but it's something on that order of magnitude. And so that's obviously less than all of the Bitcoins that Jill is talking about. But I think the, the, the question that she's asking in some ways is uh, a question about where are, what are pockets of hidden centralization or non-obvious centralization um, that might uh, impact this, this industry, right? And so she's talking about custody, where, where these, these Bitcoins are actually housed um, physically. And, uh, and that's one area of potential vulnerability. But I think there are others as well. You know, any time that there's a, uh, a third party ecosystem actor that's important for the way that we use Bitcoin or the way that we function Bitcoin, it may have some impact on how the market is, uh, shapes and is played out. So, you know, I don't necessarily think that uh, it's like a warning call or, a, you know, a clarion call for, for something different just yet. But it's more like these are the types of questions that are um, going to be really important to ask the more that institutions get involved with uh, with crypto assets. But do you think the, the, the sort of the in terms of the questions being asked, do you think there is the regulatory framework in place or, or even the self governance of the community in place enough to uh, ensure that we don't end up with these sort of bottlenecks that just uh, end up mirroring the mainstream financial sector? Or is this seemingly an inevitability, uh, you know, in the in the system that as the crypto sphere grows, as more institutions get involved, it, we're inevitably headed towards you know, this sort of bottlenecking as we've seen mirrored in other sectors? There are inevitable forces that push towards centralization, I believe. Um, that doesn't mean that they're all bad. They're just, it's, it's kind of a fact of, of, uh, of nature, right? There, there's just forces like that. Um, the question is to what extent uh, the community adapts to them and what are, to your exact point, both the kind of socially mandated and then potentially in the long term, uh, more, you know, governance mandated or, or you know, enforceable uh, ways that we combat the downsides of, of some of those potential uh, forces for centralization. I would say that right now what we have is um, a whole lot of canaries in the coal mine. Right. Uh, in a lot of ways, the um, the Bitcoin Twitter community functions largely as uh, an early warning signal for a lot of these things. Right. I think a, a good example that comes to mind is Caitlin Long's writings about uh, rehypothecation for Forbes and other publications um, as a potential area where that, you know, kind of de facto threatens the 21 million hard cap on Bitcoin. Um, so you're going to see a lot more like that. And I think that's why conversations like the one Jill are having are so important to have in advance.
Well, certainly important to have these philosophical discussions before we get beyond the chance to have them uh, at the individual level anymore. But I'm going to move now to our number two for this week. Uh, and ask an important question. So BACT announced that its uh, futures trading become available in September. And Nathaniel, is it significant? Yes. So the, the reason I think that, uh, that some were saying, wait a second, wh why is this so big is because the way that people were talking about it was with such elevated terms, right? Uh, you had people who were, you know, credible voices who were saying this is the biggest news of the year or longer, right? Uh, that this was actually coming, which was the same thing that people said when back was announced. Um, and there were a whole bunch of reasons that they, they listed and, and they came back to it. Um, they came back to it again. One is the, the pedigree of the institutions involved, right? This is obviously the, the same owner of the New York Stock Exchange. Um, another is this idea of what futures do for price discovery and for market legitimacy by giving you a way to interact with the, the asset um, in, a, in a much stronger uh, way. You, you get to a, a more real price that is importantly more trusted by actors who are maybe skeptical, right? So one of the big questions for the Bitcoin ETF is uh, whether there's kind of sufficient market information information for pricing it and potentially this helps. Uh, but then there's the, the, the big piece that I think a lot of people were pointing to as well was the idea that these are physically settled. So, you know, the, the difference here is that uh, if you have a cash settled uh, futures product or a derivative product, it just means that whatever whatever the outcome is, it's it's settled up with either a debit or a credit that's payable in you know USD or cash. So you don't ever actually have to own or hold the underlying asset. Um, it's just kind of a, almost like a betting on the price, or you know. And whereas with a physically settled futures product, settlement actually involves uh, handing over the, the the bitcoins in this case involved, uh, which obviously means that someone has to buy the bitcoins, which means that there's a much higher, uh, powerful signal on uh, for the market on price. So that's what people are really, I think, most excited about in terms of how this is different from something like the other futures products we've seen, is the diff the, the, the fact that it's physically settled. So all combined, you have something that uh, creates potential more market pressure directly in the form of uh, actually having to, to, to hold and custody these assets that are um, that are that are under question. And then also just the, the again, the, the legitimacy of the player uh, and the number of, of these institutional actors who might be kind of just sitting on the sidelines or, or hovering around the sidelines waiting to get in uh, for something like this. So all in all, I do think it's a huge deal, especially to the extent that you believe that institutionalization is an important next step for uh, for Bitcoin as an asset. And certainly even looking just uh, in the short term and the present impact on the market since that announcement was made, we've seen Bitcoin up uh, around $1,000 or so since then. I mean, do you think you're going to see the, the impact of this as we approach September uh, being ever you know, more weighted on the market? Do you think it can be that level of significant in the short term or are you looking to a longer term gain when it comes to the impacts we're going to see with, with this and backed announcement? I'm I'm more interested in the longer term just because we've had you know we've seen so the backed announcement originally uh, you know we had a chance to kind of price in that signal and this this is an announcement that you know maybe had some positive impacts but really this is one where uh, the the potential impact on on price and the market's long term is not just from a narrative perspective which is unusual for for us here in the Bitcoin world we're used to mostly mimetic uh, you know forces in in the markets um, this is a this show this is one that there's actual real potential uh, demand increase so I, I would anticipate the the real impact of this will be a bit longer term. Uh, and, and I'm not exactly sure when, when it starts. Um, I think to some extent it has to do with uh, how, how, how fast they push once they actually launch. But it's certainly a positive, I think, for, for, uh, for, for the medium and long term. Mm, certainly, yeah. September could be a very interesting month when it comes to the crypto sphere. We'll all have to continue watching closely. And that leads us now to our number one for this week. An interesting one, a story that I wouldn't say uh, made global headlines, but one certainly with significance, talking about Electric Capital and their uh, developer activity report. What's the significance you put to this, Nathaniel? Yeah, so sometimes with with this list, uh, you know, the 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 countdown is largely predicated on what's the biggest news or most important news of the week. And frankly, last week was a classic kind of August week where lots of interesting things. The backed announcement was big, uh, but ultimately it's kind of a, a a mid range week. I mean, I think that this Binance news, for example, is as big as anything we saw last week. Um, however, I also like to really focus on where people are doing uh, great, insightful work or research that uh, that can 
and help us understand this, this industry better. And so Electric Capital is a venture firm. Um, this is their second dev ecosystem report. And basically they dig into GitHub uh, in terms of all of these kind of open repositories and they look to see uh, which projects have the most activity, how many developers are contributing overall, um, and just what the trend lines are. And this is a really important signal because you know we're, we're used to seeing the data around price, obviously, um, but in some ways that functions almost irrespective, at least in the short term, of, uh, of, of what's actually being built and sort of fundamentals. And so this dev report is almost the exact opposite of that, which is um, not really subject to, to price, just seeing what, what devs are doing. So uh, for example, they kind of showed that year over year, basically, um, the amount of kind of, uh, of, of commits was pretty flat, right? It didn't matter that it was a, a really bad market. You saw something similar. Now they saw also that the total number of developers contributing uh, kind of across projects had gone down uh, slightly. But what they found was that that was actually a, uh, uh, that dip was almost entirely attributable to part-time developers, a reduction in part-time developer contributes. So those developers who made, you know, uh, one con contribution per month um, or less. And, uh, and at the same time, full-time developers actually went up. So this may square with the idea that uh, there's kind of the, the interest that remained during the bear market was more dedicated, more passionate. So um, there's a lot of interesting things in here, but I think that the overall signal is that contributions to the space, developer interest remains uh, consistent kind of regardless of price. Now, we haven't uh, seen this sort of developer report for what happens when uh, the market really gets going again and, and how people come in. Um, and I also think it's important to note that this dev report is focused on specifically contributions to the actual protocol layer. So this doesn't necessarily take into account how many developers are now working on uh, ecosystem projects that that maybe aren't uh, open source or aren't contributed, right? There's entire uh, large kind of closed source financial uh, or different different types of products that sit on top of these protocols um, that may also have efforts. So overall, I think it's a really positive signal, uh, you know, kind of a, a lagging indicator of uh, of how things are going in the space and something that's important that we keep keep an eye on, uh, so that we're not just entirely focused always on what short term price action suggests about about the health of the industry. Certainly a very important thing to note. Some of those key numbers I'm always agreeing and saying data is king. We need to make sure we're seeing what's happening in this sphere. Love, people love to speculate, but it's important to get the real numbers out on the table. Reports like this do just that. And I want to thank you, Nathaniel Whitmore, for drawing and highlighting this important information and much like it. Thank you so much for Long Read Sunday this week. I look forward to next week when I'm sure, as we've started off this Monday with a lot to talk about, there'll be plenty to discuss come next week. So Nathaniel Whitmore, again, thanks for joining us on Block TV and stay with us at blocktv.com for all the latest in news and information. I'm Asher Westrop Evans. Thanks for watching. For more news and updates, follow us on Twitter.